author opinion of Dennis Keane at the history, geography and architecture, culture and life matters of Kazakhs in the program Discovering Kazakhstan. On today's program, Kazakhstan's literary heartland, mausoleums on the steppe, Renaissance men of the 19th century. Salam, Priyat, and hello. I'm Dennis Keen, and today on Discovering Kazakhstan, we will be discovering the literary heartland of Eastern Kazakhstan. Three giants of Kazakh poetry and literature all come from the same clan, and they were born here in this lonely section of the steppe outside of the city of Semei. Abai, Shakarim, and Muktau Awezev had an enormous impact on the Kazakh arts, and they left their mark on this landscape as well. Come along as we discover the beating heart of intellectual Kazakhstan. Nearly every settlement in Kazakhstan has some kind of town sign on its outskirts, but the town of Zhizibai, 180 kilometers from the city of Semei, may be the only one that's written in Arabic. Zhizibai is home to one of the most sacred monuments in the entire country, the Abai Shakarim Mausoleum Complex. It's devoted to two great Kazakh philosophers of the 19th century, Abai and Shakarim, who would have used this Arabic script long before the later introduction of Latin and Cyrillic. These two great towers, looking all the taller, surrounded by the flatness of the steppe, are the mausoleums of Abai and Shakarim. They opened in 1995 to mark the 150-year anniversary of Abai's birthday. 1995 was declared the Year of Abai by UNESCO and 20,000 people showed up to partake in the opening ceremonies, including the president of Kazakhstan himself. But the timing was important for another reason, because the Republic of Kazakhstan was only four years old, and this young country was in search of new heroes. But just who were Abai and Shakarim, and how did they earn such esteem? Both were famous poets and philosophers famous for articulating a unique steppe philosophy. Both were well-versed in Russian culture and served as a kind of bridge between West and East, modernity and tradition. As you enter the foyer, you will encounter the first of many tall cones reaching up to the heavens, a mysterious motif used all over the complex. In the corner, we can see the original gravestone that was placed at the mausoleum of Abai at the initiative of Mukhtar Awezev. For a lot of people, it may be the first time they've seen Kazakh written not just in the Cyrillic script, but in the Latin script that was common during the early years of the Soviet Union. Next to the gravestone, we can see a historical photo showing the ceremony where they placed the stone itself in 1940. They're standing in front of the old mausoleum, which has these four towers on the different corners. It seems that this complex was built in homage to the original structure. It's a strange feeling entering the complex. You walk through this dark tunnel as if you're a gladiator entering the Colosseum, but at the end there are no cheering crowds, just a small amphitheater perfect for quiet contemplation and intimate special events. They say that the architects built color symbolism into their design. The black here representing the underworld, the red the terrestrial realm, and the white, 
the heavens above, the three levels of Kazakh cosmology. When you rise up to the upper level of the memorial, you see a flat space stretching out around you, seeming to merge with the step beyond, yet at the same time somehow seeming to rise above it. Dominating this flat space are two tall towers, one in the mausoleum of Abai, the other the mausoleum of his relative, Shah Karim. At the four corners of the memorial, there are small towers specifically built for pilgrims. Inside is a small room for prayer and communion with the ancestors. Abai's ancestral home was turned into a home museum in 1945. And since then, it remains a kind of time capsule back to what some people call the golden age of the Kazakh written word. Traditionally, when Kazakhs would first meet, one of the things they would first discuss would be their clans and their ancestors. And thus, it's appropriate that when we come into the Abai Home Museum, one of the first things we see is an extensive family tree. Starting with the trunk of the tree itself here, Abai's great, 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 great grandfather, Olzai, going all the way down to his ancestors who are alive in the present day, living in the city of Almaty. In this initial room that tells of Abai's family ties, there's one exhibit that is tinged with tragedy. It is the stone marker that Abai placed himself at the grave of his younger brother, Ospan. But out of this tragedy comes some beauty, because the stone marker itself is remarkably beautiful. It's been painted in this gorgeous dark green color and the Arabic calligraphy on there is unlike any writing I've ever seen. If there's any room that you can't miss in the museum though, it's of course the writer's office, because this is the very chair and the very desk where Abai sat and wrote some of his greatest works. But what a lot of people don't know is that Abai was also a translator. Here on the desk are pages from the works of the Russian writers Lermontov and Pushkin, who Abai was the very first to ever translate from Russian to Kazakh, introducing a whole world of Russian literature to the Kazakh people. Like any of us, Abai was not perfect. There must have been moments when he was struck with writer's block and he needed to have some kind of distraction. So here in the middle of the office is a table with some of his games. This is a traditional Kazakh game called Pulus Komalak, where these stones are passed around a carved wooden board. Or here is an old board for some kind of checkers where the pieces are apparently made out of sheep bones. But there's one oddity on this table that is not a game, but was in fact a part of the poet himself, his false teeth.
on the desolate road between Abai's wintering grounds in Jijibai and his home base in Semei, you can find a turnoff for Borodye, a town that considers itself the homeland of Muqtaw Awezev, the most famous Kazakh poet from the Soviet period and the founding scholar of Abaiology. A well-preserved Soviet mosaic made of small tiles in primary colors shows the primary tools of the writer, the quill and the book. It advertises the town's main attraction, the Muqtaw Awezev Home Museum. In a town not found on many maps, it's just a handful of homes. But one of them is the home where Muqtaw Awezev spent his formative childhood years before moving to Semei for his education. Even if you're coming from a land far away and you've never heard of the great Kazakh writer, what makes this museum enjoyable to visit is just how lovingly it's been decorated. In the entry foyer already, we have this wall consisting of a series of beautifully decorated tapestries showing the scenery with which Awezev grew up. And here, a striking bust made of marble. Other rooms in the Awezev house have been set aside for displaying exhibits but one room has been transformed into a traditional Kazakh winter storage room called a Toshala. The centerpiece of the Toshala are these four logs with these branches coming out of them. It's called an Adal Bakhan. And what this is used for is a traditional form of smoking meat. In the fall, to prepare for the long hard winter ahead, Kazakhs would slaughter some of their animals and they would take the meat, hang them on the branches here, and light a campfire in the middle. That smoke would then come up and smoke the meat and allow this meat to be used in the long, hard months ahead. Coming into the first exhibition hall of the museum, even if you can't read a thing in here, you will just be impressed by the beauty of the room itself from the windows here that have been decorated with these transparent sunscreens painted with watercolor to these attentively detailed murals that have been put on the wall to the decorative carpets that are hanging at the end of the room complete with wolf skins. This room tells of Mukhtar's humble beginnings. They even have an old photograph of the adobe hut where he was born. When he was only 11, the young Mukhtar lost his father and he was adopted by his uncle, who sent him to study at a school in the nearby city of Semei. There he fell in love with sports and he had the distinction of playing on the first ever Kazakh soccer team called Irmash the sport apparently having been introduced by a couple of British merchants in 1913. We can see him here in the first team photo. Since he was a young boy, Mukhtar would listen to the stories of his grandfather Awiz, who was a friend of the great Abai. And Mukhtar became obsessed with this man and his life and works eventually dedicating his greatest novel, The Path of a Bai, to the story of this great man's life. But these two great figures of the Kazakh word, Abai and Muqtaw Awezev, were tightly connected by the land where they grew up. And here we have a beautiful topographical model that shows us just how closely connected they were. On this end, we have Jidubai, where we went and saw the mausoleum of Abai himself just over a small mountain pass, past the monument of Yen de Quebec, is the very village of Borile where we stand now. These two men came from the same great land that they call Shungus Tao. 
In addition to being remembered as the greatest Kazakh novelist of all time, Mukhtar Arezov is also remembered as being the greatest writer of Kazakh libretos, so that is, the text for Kazakh operas. After he moved to Almaty as a young man, he became involved in this new art form of the Kazakh opera, where performers would wear Kazakh outfits, play Kazakh instruments, sing in the Kazakh language but in an operatic style. Here we can see some various images from these first Kazakh operas that were written by Alweza, including The Legend of Yenlik Kubek. After gaining renown throughout the Soviet Union, Mukhtar Awezev was given a fine two-story home in the center of Almaty, which now houses the second Mukhtar Awezev Home Museum. In this museum, they have a small model of this home where he would go on to spend the later years of his life. One thing I like about the model is that you can see that in the back of the home, he had a little terrace. Still competitive all these years after playing for FC Irmash, Mukhtar installed a pool table on the back terrace so he could play billiards with a cool breeze. One of the coolest things about visiting these kinds of home museums is that you can see the personal possessions that have some kind of material connection to these legendary figures. In this museum, we can see a suit that once belonged to the great writer. In this display case, we have various gifts that were given to the author, including these amazing shot glasses that were made out of this kind of embossed metal given to him by the writer Yesengoti Shepkupov. One room of the museum is dedicated to the foreign trips that Awezov took after he became famous. We see a photo of the author standing in front of the Taj Mahal. In a display case, a souvenir that he took home from India, an ashtray shaped like a fish. But one thing that caught my eye was that Mukhtar Awezov went to my motherland. In 1960, he took a road trip across America and even visited the Grand Canyon. This room tries to recreate what the inside of Alweza's home might have looked like when he lived here at the turn of the century. We have the low table called the Dastar Khan, where you would sit cross-legged and drink your tea, or in this case, khumuz, the fermented horse milk that would be served with this kind of wooden ladle. We have these beautifully carved wooden chests called sunduk, even a wooden bed not sure how comfortable that would be. You can see that it is raised on both sides in a classic Kazakh style. What is comfortable are these fox fur hats called tamak that are traditionally worn by Kazakhs of Eastern Kazakhstan. Over a small hill from Alweza's childhood home, you will find a brilliantly white mausoleum dedicated to the memory of his parents, who he tragically lost at such a young age. Kazakhs never forget where they come from, and behind every Kazakh great were family members who inspired them to greatness. It's no surprise to find such a grand mausoleum for Alweza's parents, because he would quite literally be nothing without them. Situated at the end of the village, with sage grasslands rolling in the vast space beyond, it's a peaceful place where we can all give thanks to the people who brought us into this world. Ever since the Abai Museum opened in 1940 in Sumay, it has been the center of Abai scholarship in Kazakhstan. In 1995, a new wing was added with 
grand arches and a big blue dome, the color of the Kazakh flag. The museum grounds are quite large, also including the historic Ahmed Rizi Mosque, where Abai studied from 1854 to 1859. The main entrance is located in the oldest wing of the museum, the former home of the Yershov brothers. Russian merchants who would often host a buy and introduce him to exiled intellectuals. At the entrance to the museum, we're kindly greeted by a plaster statue of a buy himself. And just as in the entrance to the Always of Home Museum, there's also a beautiful tapestry that's been put up on the wall. This one designed by Shamil Kozhanov shows on one side Western and Russian culture, and on the other traditional Kazakh culture, a by serving as the bridge between these two civilizations. Incredibly instructional is this fantastically detailed relief map showing the place that they call Ulalar Mekine, the land of legends, because this was the homeland to the three greats of the Kazakh language, Abai, Shakarim, and Muktal Awezov. Some of the places that we might recognize here are Zhidibai, where we saw the wintering home of Abai and the mausoleum of Abai and Shakarim, Borle, where Muktal Awezov was born, and Sime, where all three men studied and worked. If you live outside of Kazakhstan and you're interested in reading some Kazakh poetry or literature, Abai is your best bet because he is the most widely translated Kazakh writer of all time. In this hallway, there is a library exhibit of different books of Abai's that have been translated into various languages. So we have it in Japanese, in Arabic, in German, his book, which is in English, is called The Book of Words. They also have these miniature books so that you can keep a buy in your pocket and always have them close to your heart. For nomads of Abai's generation, summer was a special time of celebration, when the trials of winter had long passed and nomads would set up their yurts in wide pastures and gorge on fresh dairy products. Jaz, or summer, was one of Abai's most famous poems, part of a cycle about the four seasons. And there's one room in the museum that is entirely dedicated to this famous poem. We have this beautifully decorated summer yurt. On the walls, a mural showing scenes of summer fun. And planted in the sand here, the fragrant grasses of the summer steppe. Just as in the entrance, this room has a large display showing how Abai was a bridge between two cultures. He was enamored of European writers like Lord Byron and Goethe, but at the same time, he was a voracious reader of writers of the Muslim world. Abai was a polyglot. He spoke Arabic and Persian and Turkic. At the same time, he could read Russian and he used these influences to inform his legendary work. Behind the large bus of a bai, there's what might at first look like the same kind of decorative tapestry that we saw before. But this is in fact chi, 
or reed mats, a textile art that is unique to the Kazakhs. Chi is made by taking these long pieces of grass, drying them, and then wrapping them with dyed strands of felt. For Abai's 150-year birthday, the museum inaugurated this amphitheater, a 360-degree performance space lined with these unusual green chairs built into the walls. I can imagine Abai himself wanting to perform here, surrounded by adoring fans serenading them with poem and song. There's one more exhibition hall where we can learn a little bit more about Shakarim, with books that were written about his work and paintings that were made in his honor. Shakarim lived at the turn of the last century, and there's only one good quality photograph of him. That creates an unusual effect because we see the same haunting image of the bearded bard over and over and over again. In this special room about Shakarim, you quickly realize that he was just as much of a Renaissance man as Abai himself. He was a poet, a writer, a historian, a philosopher, a translator, and a composer. Though he's probably best known as a philosopher, I think that his music is also very well known. In fact, one of his songs was included in the collection of Zatayev, an anthology that is considered the Bible for fans of Kazakh folk music. To really emphasize this musical contribution, there's this beautiful art piece that's been made here. Shakirim very much emphasized the Kazakh worldview. So here we have two of his dombras floating in front of a scene of the steppe surrounded by the cosmos. Like Abai, Shakarim also practiced Khuspegilik, or eagle hunting. And in this case, we can see some tools of this trade. There is the leather glove that is used when holding a bird to protect your wrist from the sharp talons, or this kind of crutch that you can connect to your belt to support the weight of these heavy creatures or there in the back. It's called a tomaga, a special hat or hood that is placed over the eagle's eyes to keep it calm. In a room at the Abai Museum dedicated to Mukhtar Awezov, there are three great examples of works that were inspired by this author. One is this woven tapestry showing the young writer here and his muse hovering above, scenes from his books shining like beams of light. In another, we see a series of lithographs that use the Cyrillic letters from Mukhtar Awezov's name to show scenes from his various works. In each case, the characters and creatures from his stories have been creatively incorporated into the letters themselves. In one more epic work, the author is shown in the middle, wearing an ornamental robe called a chapan. All around him, characters from his most famous work, The Path of Abai. The scenes shown here are colorful and exotic, like a man playing the dombra, another holding a hawk on his fist, one holding a big platter of meat, A lot of museum goers like to share their impressions of the place in the museum guest book. Well, at the Abai Museum, you may see the biggest guest book you've ever seen in your life. Look at this beautiful thing that was crafted in Germany and brought here. On the first page is a quote from Abai, of course, but on the next, we have a handwritten note from President Nazarbayev. If you're important enough, maybe you can also leave a note of your own.